I remember listening to Howard Marshall, well before the war, it'd be about 1937, I suppose. It was in the days when I was more interested in playing cricket than listening to it. But uh, the memory is absolutely distinct, and I remembered it for many years after I started to do commentary and realised just all the changes that had happened in the game and in commentary and, of course, in broadcasting. John Arlott was to become more celebrated as the voice of cricket than even that pre-war pioneer, Howard Marshall. He started in 1946. I just achieved my aspiration of becoming a poetry producer in the BBC. And I was in the Eastern Service and we had a programme planning meeting in January 1946. And the head of service, Donald Stevenson, said, isn't there an Indian cricket team, he said, with a rather distasteful tone? coming this summer and I said yes there is oh yes he said I remember from your interview you're keen on cricket he said, when do they start I said the first Wednesday in May mm, where he said I said what's that yeah, where do they go then I said Oxford he said how do you know I said because I've got the fixture list in my office he said have you ever done a cricket broadcast yet said I stretching the truth because all I'd ever done was a, a 15 minute talk about Hambledon but uh, he said would you like to do it and I thought someone had turned me upside down. It was impossible. So I gasped out, yes. He said, can you do your programs and that as well? And I said, yes. So he sent me off to do them. And when I got back on the Wednesday, the head of service said, if you want to continue, you can. You did it, but you must get your programs done. So I missed, I think, about five programs that summer. I ended up so broke it wasn't true. But, you know, for the others, it was no great translation. They, they were somewhere about there. But for me, it was a sort of seventh heaven to be watching cricket and talking about it and being paid for it. You've got to be a natural talker because there's a time when a fast bowler walks back to his mark when you've got a devil of a lot of filling in to do. It is a contemplative game, you see. It is a game that produces art, painting, writing, poetry, and I suppose commentary is just a step down from that. By 1948, when Don Bradman brought one of the greatest Australian sides to England, Arlott was part of the regular team which broadcast ball-by-ball -ball commentary to Australia and large slices of it to the domestic audience. Australia won at Trent Bridge and at Lords, and by drawing the third test at Old Trafford ensured that they retained the Ashes. But the fourth test at Headingley is one of the most celebrated of all matches. It started well for England as Len Hutton and Cyril Washbrook blunted the attack of Linwall and Miller with a large opening partnership until the second new ball was due. Tester indicates that he's about to take it, shows it with a warning and paternal air to Hutton and Linwall seizes it. He's just going to bowl with a new ball now from the grandstand end. Goes through the usual Linwall bout of physical jerks. The shirt is now comfortably loose and it fills with wind as he comes up now from the grandstand end. Bowls the first ball to Hutton, a magnificent outswinger. <laughs> Hit for four. Now that was hit on the half volley by Hutton for four and a difficult ball it was to cope with. Over it lo its last two yards it went eight inches. It went off the line of the middle and off, clean outside the off stump. And Hutton right over it, hit it firmly past the somnolent Toshak at point for four runs. And now here comes Lindwall again to Hutton. And that was a magnificent inswinger that pulled him off his pad.
that was another magnificent ball. It's got rid of Hutton, and he is out. Bold Lindwall. 81. Hutton, Bold Lindwall, 81. England are 168 for one. On the final day of that great test match, England declared, setting Australia 404 to win in just under a full day's play, a seemingly impossible task. But a stand of 301 for the second wicket between Arthur Morris and Don Bradman took Australia to the brink of victory. Morris was out for 182, and Bradman made 173 not out, his fourth test century at Leeds. John Allett described the end of the match. For 55 runs, he bowled six maidens, and although it wasn't policy to use a pace bowler all day long, whenever he was called upon, he did his job on a wicket that, if it suited any bowler, certainly suited a spinner. Well, there was no leg spinner in the England side except Hutton, or Compton when he bowls his left arm googly, and neither of those looked good enough to worry great batsmen who were bent on taking up England's challenge of fast runs. They took it up and they met it. Well, now Cranston comes to meet to bowl to Harvey. Harvey picks him off his toes, Hits him to the long arm boundary, and he's stolen a stump, and the ball's crossed the boundary, and it's all over. And we greet our general overseas listeners at the moment that the great crowd surges all across the road despite the police all across the ground despite the policeman forms a corridor for the players as they go in and australia won the fourth test at headingley by seven wickets two and a half weeks later at the oval don bradman played his last test match rex alston described the scene as he came in to bat here's the applause for bradman as he comes in a wonderful reception the whole crowd is standing and the England team are joining in and led by Yardley three cheers for the Don as he gets to the wicket Yardley went up to Bradman and shook him by the hand and then called for three cheers and now the crowd settled down again they've got 40 minutes 40 minutes more left for play and uh, Bradman is now taking guard Hollis is going to bowl at him and John Arlott shall describe the first ball. So come on, John. Well, I don't think I'm as deadly as you are, Rex. I don't expect to get a wicket, but it's rather good to be here at when Don Bradman comes into bat his last test. And now here's Hollies to bowl to him from the Vauxhall end. He bowls, Bradman goes back across his wicket and pushes the ball gently in the direction of the House of Houses of Parliament, which are out beyond mid-off. It doesn't go that far. It merely goes to Watkins at silly mid-off. No run, still 117 for one. Two slips, a silly mid-off and a forward short leg close to him as Hollies pitches the ball up slowly and he's bowled. Bradman, Bold, Hollies, not. Bold, Hollies, not. And what do you say under those circumstances? How, I wonder if you see a ball very clearly in your last test in England, the ground where you played out some of the biggest cricket of your life and where the opposing team have just stood around you and given you three cheers and the crowd has clapped you all the way to the wicket. 
I wonder if you really see the ball at all. Anyway, Bradman went forward. It was Holly's googly. It clean bowled him, groping right down the pitch. And he was just beaten all the way. I think he was completely out of his crease and would have been stumped if it hadn't hit the wicket. He didn't seem to make any attempt to get back. He knew it had bowled him. Australia are 117 for two in reply to England, 52. Despite the failure of Bradman, Australia were heading for an innings victory. Bill Johnston's bowling and nothing in a way could be more fitting than if Johnston were to take the last wicket of this series. The most improved bowler of, of the series and a man of whom I think we shall hear very, very much in the future. Probably always be a better bowler in England than in Australia. The greater humidity of our atmosphere makes him very dangerous indeed. Now here he comes from the Vauxhall end and he bowls to Holly and Holly swings him hard and high, everyone stolen stumps and Morris has caught him. It took an awful long time to come down. Every stump was out of the ground and every bale was in a player's pocket before Arthur Morris made that catch. And, and England are all out 188. All out 188. Barnes has got a stump. Neither Young nor Hollies has. And now, uh, yes, they both got bats. And as a small boy wants their autographs, he's being removed by two policemen, uh, by a policeman and an official. Umpire Davies has got a stump. Loxton's got a bail. And now in com almost complete silence, these last two batsmen, Jack Young, not out three, Eric Hollies, not Port Morris, both Johnston come back into the pavilion and the fifth test and the England-Australia series of 1948 is all over. Australia retain the ashes, win the series by four tests to none, the first time I believe that that's ever been done and the players are now all back in the pavilion and the crowd is coming slowly out from its seat and round towards, on one side at least, round towards the pavilion. In the English winter which followed, the MCC went to South Africa with John Arlott as the BBC's man on the tour. He had some thrilling finishes to describe. In the first test in Durban, for instance, England needed 128 to win. 121 for eight. Seven balls, seven runs. Bad light, steady rain, and Lindsay Tuckett bowling with only two men near the wicket. A split and a silly mid-on. Balls to Gladwin. Gladwin's white sits up in the long field. It's over the field from his head and it's gone for four. 125 for eight. One, two, five for eight. Three to win. Two wickets to fall. Six balls to go. Cliff Gladwin, who hits a catch every ball. And if he goes, Doug Wright follows him and he only gets one ball and hits a certain catch off that. 125 for eight. Three wickets to fall. The last over. Tuck it to bowl the third ball. Bowls to Gladwin, a bumper. Off Gladwin's wrist, the long leg. 126. They don't take one for the throw. 126 for eight. Two to win. That was the third ball. If this goes five balls, there'll be no commentator left. And Bedter touching his toes then, I think, for mental relaxation. Tuck it, wiping the bat on the ball, the ball on the towel. The hills of North Durban completely hidden by rain, which is falling steadily round the box. And Tuck it bowls to Bedter, and Bedter swings. And Dudley North has stopped. He can try to run him out. And he's hit him, but he hasn't run him out. 126 for eight. Quick return there from North when they were thinking about a run, a scuttled recovery, and he even forgot to limp. And he had a blow like a ton of bricks on the left shin at the start of this inning. Tuck it to Bedsa from the Umgani end. Two to win. And he's wiped at it. And it hit him in the stomach. And it was passing off foot over. And 5,000 people appealed, and I don't blame them. Three balls. Three balls to go. Two runs. Two wickets. The last over, once started, must be finished. Tuck it from the, the Umgani end to Alec Bedsar. A bumper, edge, out to cover. They're gonna run, they'll never make it. Oh. They, they've missed it, there's a lot. They don't take the overthrow, 127 for eight. 127 for eight. They didn't dare try the overthrow. I don't think either of them has got sufficient nerve or sufficient wind. 
and I certainly have no wind at all. Two balls, one run, two wickets. And the two wickets could go just as easily as the one run could come. It's a tie. One to win. It's a tie and two balls to go. And Lindsay Tuckett's got to bowl. And he's bowling to Gladwin. And it's a bouncer. It's outside the leg stump. And Wade, in an attitude of prayer, prevents it from being buys. And the next one, they've got to run whatever happens. Tuckett from the Umgani end to Cliff Gladwin. One run to win and one ball to go. Tuckett to Gladwin. And he's knuckled it, and they're running, and Bencher is not run out, and they've won on the last ball of the last over. And any sane man would tell you that England have won by two wickets. If you wanted to put it in a book, no one would ever believe it. It belongs to a novel, not wisdom. Never in all my life have I imagined that I would see such a finish. <laughs> Carrying Gladwin in now, and anyone else who, who's got the strength even to be carried. And McCarthy. And this wicket now looks even worse than it did a minute ago, because half Durban is running on it. All juvenile Durban. It's just the most incredible finish. And for anyone who's got the patience to listen, Gladwin makes made seven, and neither I, Gladwin, the bowler, or anyone else could tell you how he made them. Bedsa made one. Oh, I do know the last one of Gladwin's was off both knuckles. And McCarthy took, what did he take? It's his afternoon, six for 44. Three drawn matches followed, but in the final test at Port Elizabeth, South Africa set England 172 to win in only 95 minutes. The challenge was taken up. 150 for five. England was 22 runs in a quarter of an hour after that Gladwin six, but there's not much forcing batting to come. In fact, there are not an awful lot of wickets to spare anyway, because they've all got to hit like fury. Man to bowl to Gladwin, pitched up. Gladwin forward defensive, and it only goes a couple of yards. They run a gallop single as Kieran McCarthy stretching further than you think a man could stretch. Gets the ball to Billy Wade. Jack Crap gets the bowling. 1-5-1 one, one for 5. 21 to win. 21 to win, 5 wickets to fall. And now Tufty Man bowling from this end where we are, the swimming pool end. Slow left arm round the wicket. Comes up now, bowls to Crap, who goes down the wicket. Miss hits him, sends it off the inside edge. Pass Rowan at Salim it on. They get one, they're, going to, they're contemplating a second, but a very quick run in and pick up by Cheatham sends them back. Only one, one, five, two, 20 wanted. 20 now in 14 minutes. 20 in 14 minutes. Tufty man to bowl to Gladwin. North at long on, tuck it at long off. Cheatham deep extra cover. The three men that count. Gladwin's down the wicket, it's lofted hard and high. Tuck it's running here under it, and he's got it. He's held it. I couldn't see him, but he's held it. Gladwin's out. One, five, two for six. And here comes Billy Griffith now, passing Gladwin on his way out. Running out. One, five, two for six. England wants 20. Four wickets to fall. About 13 minutes to go. And Billy Griffith, who hit a four in the first innings, and that's one of the first fours Billy's hit for a very long time. First one in a test match, I'm sure, since his 100 against the West Indies last year. They ran a single while it was crossing. Cramp's got the bowling, man to bowl to him, Eric Rowan steals up close at Silly Mid on, North long off, tuck it long on, bowls to Cramp, Cramp chips it, down past split, and Griffiths makes good his ground, 1-5-3, 19 wanted, 13 minutes, man bowling, and he's to bowl to Griffiths, and for the pull, for the agricultural pull, he's stationed two mid wickets. Two mid-wickets on the leg side, and one man out deep behind him, a long on, he bowls to Griffith, Griffith goes down, swings at the full toss, and it's clean bowled. One, five, three, four, seven. One, five, three, four, seven. Three wickets to fall. Here comes the next man, Alan Watkins. He's 20 yards out before Billy Griffith can get in, and this can now go either way. It may be that 
I ought at this juncture to try to read the scorecard. Well, here it is. Hutton and Washbrook, 58 for the first wicket. Hutton stumped Wade, bowled Rowan, 32. Washbrook caught Athel Rowan, bowled man, 40. Compton caught Cheatham, bowled Athel Rowan, 42. Man caught Dawson, bowled man, 2. Bedser caught North, bowled Rowan, 1. Gladwin caught Tuckett, bowled man, 19. Griffith, bowled man, naught. And there's the first ball to Alan Watkins, pushed out defensively on the offside. Man goes after it, embraces Cramp as he realises it's unnecessary, and is back. Hutton, Washbrook and Compton started it. Now it remains for these men to finish it. Next one to Watkins, top square. Away past short third man, Bruce Mitchell. They get one, they get a second as he turns, picks it up over at the far end. One, one, five, five, is it? One, five, five for seven. One, five, five for seven. 17 runs, two wickets, 11 or 12 minutes. I can't quite see the pavilion clock, and that's the one that counts. Not all the Greenwich mean time in the world. It seems to me to show 10. 10 minutes by the pavilion clock. 17 runs, three wickets, Athel Rowan bowling, and Rowan's figures, have we got them? Rowan's figures, three for 61. Three for 61 off nine overs, and that's hitting. He's going round the wicket to Jack Crapp. Two left-handers now, so there'll be no change of the field. Crapp swings hard and high on the leg side, and, oh, first bounce to the fieldsman. They take a single. Watkins makes his ground, 156. One, five, six, four, seven. 16 wanted. 16 wanted, three wickets to fall. Watkins and Crapp in, but both of them hitting, so they might go at any moment. Now, Rowan comes up, bowls to Watkins. Watkins turns it on the leg side. A single down to McCarthy at fine leg. One, five, seven for seven. Three to Watkins, 14 to Crap. One, five, seven for seven. 15 to win. Three wickets to fall. Just under 10 minutes to go. We'll try and get this pavilion clock in line now. Just turned up from 10 to He bowls to Crap. Rowan does, who chops him to Mitchell at short third man. Retreated from slip and no run. The field, a slip, a short third man, a cover, deep extra cover, mid off, mid on rather deep, a long on, a deep square leg, and a fine leg as Rowan comes in, bowls to Crap. Crap pushes him away again on the offside for another single. Watkins comes down. And this recalls to me an ancient test match in England when there was plenty of time to do it then, as there isn't now. And as Wilfred Rhodes, later to go in first for England, came in last man, George Hurst said we'll get him in singles. Well, now Rowan to Watkins. Appeal for LBW, rising over the top, I think. Given out. No ball, sorry. As the umpire's hand went, oh, I thought he'd given him out. It's a no ball. No ball. Hit Watkins right on the top of the pads. Flew over his head. They took a single. One, five, nine. Thirteen wanted. Row into Crap. Crap down the wicket. Miss hits. Away on the offside. A single. Leg by. One, sixty. One, sixty. England, a hundred and sixty for seven. Twelve to win. About eight, seven or eight minutes to go. Athel Rowan bowling to Watkins. Outside the off stump, Watkins tries to cut, misses, Wade takes very well indeed. Rowan's making pace off the wicket. He's keeping a fairly low flight. He's not throwing anything up. But he's digging in, he's got three for 61. And he's coming in now to bowl to Alan Watkins again. He bowls to him, Watkins turns the ball off his body, down on the on side. McCarthy comes again from fine leg and field. And it's a single. One, six, one, 11 wanted. 11 wanted, end of Rowan's over. Man has taken three for 53 in nine overs. And now he's going to bowl again, I think, from the town end in failing light. You might possibly get away with an appeal, but I doubt it. Nevertheless, it's a bit dim. Light's a bit dim. Uh, Dudley North coming out now to deep extra cover to Watkins. Rowan three for 66 in 10 overs, only five runs off that over. Man to Watkins, outside the off stump, hits hard on the offside. Crap and man run foul of one another on the offside again. But the ball goes out to deep extra, where McCarthy, with that appallingly long stride of his, makes a great stretch for it. And the ring on the offside now, a ring of five men, a wide ring, attempting to cut off the one as man comes in. Both the crap goes down the wicket, hammers hard, fielded again by Dudley North at extra cover. Only a single. One, six, three. One, six, three for seven. One, six, three for seven. Nine to win. About five minutes to go. Man bowls to Watkins, who goes back onto his stumps and plays a defensive stroke to Eric Rowan at mid-arm. This is going to be mighty close. 
If these two go, there's not very much to rely on. Now, man comes in, bowls again to Watkins. Pitch well out to him, Watkins forward. A miss hit, half edge, half pad, or entirely pad. But anyway, it's a single to slip. 164, eight, eight runs, three wickets, five minutes. And if Tufty Mann feels as cool as he looks, he's the only man on the ground who does. A leisurely stroll back to bowl, and then again, slow left arm over the wicket. The crab who goes down the wicket, hits it hard and high, right over Dudley Norse's head, and it bounced on the line, it's four. This looks as if it may be it, 168. You just wouldn't believe this was the Jack, Jack Crab who batted so doggedly at Cape Town. 168 for seven, four wanted, and there must be another over to come. Man to bowl to Jack Crab, slow left round the wicket, he bowls him a quicker one, Crab down the wicket, hammers it away here on the offside. Oh, a very good stop by Norse on the run, a brilliant one. They've run a couple, it looked a certain four, and a perfect kick up by Dudley Norse. That's 170, 170 for seven, England, after a declaration by Norse that seemed impossible. 108 to score in 108 an hour, 171 in 95 minutes on a turner. And now man comes in, bolster crap, who goes down the wicket, goes hard and high again, and that's the end of the game. It's won, and Jack Crap took all three stumps from the far end. The two batsmen crossed and pinched three stumps apiece from the opposite end, and are running in now, embracing one another. I never thought this could happen twice in a series. England win by three wickets. It's an incredible finish. They've done this with five minutes to spare. They made 170 runs in 90 minutes. 170 runs in 90 minutes. A rate of 100 and almost 120 an hour. On a turner with Athel Rowan and Tufty Man, believe me, bowling very well indeed. In 1950 at Lord's, the West Indies achieved their first test victory in England, thanks largely to those little pals of mine, Ramadin and Valentine. They also had a trio of rare batting class, Worrell, Weeks and Walcott, the three Ws, and at Trent Bridge, John Arlott described Frank Worrell and Everton Weeks putting England to the sword. And now we watch Shackleton turn again, come in from the Radcliffe Road end, bowl to Worrell, and Worrell cuts him again wide of those two slips with very accurate pricing, down to Jenkins at third man, who bowls the ball in to Parkhouse at second slip. Worrell 97 now, 222 for two, 222 for two. <coughs> and now the bowler at this pavilion end is still Hollies. Hollies to Worrell from the pavilion end, the slip, a short third man, a cover, short extra, mid-off rather deep, and an extra cover on the boundaries. His offside field comes in, bowls to Worrell, and Worrell pulls oh, that wide and mid-on, four runs and his hundred. And this must be a very tired England fielding side. Been plenty of foot pounding on this. Oh, he's called in sole up from very deep at long leg. Up, Worrell and Worrell off his back foot, forces the ball to mid-on. <coughs> Apparently isn't going to let him get his 200 with a gentle deflection on the leg side, so he's brought those two fieldsmen up there close. Almost everybody could save the one now. They all close in as Yardley bowls, and Worrell off the back foot hits the ball quite hard back to the bowler himself, stops it. 3.95 for three, and Worrell's not 199. 199. One for his, any scoring stroke for his 200. Yardley bowls to him, off the back oh. foot. There it is, it's four, for good measure. Away to that long arm boundary. Yes, it's gone over with Hughes once more in pursuit. Frank Worrell, 203. And 200 in exactly four hours. He's been scoring at 50 to the hour. Two sixes and 27 fours. 120 of those 200 in boundary hit. And now Yardley bowls again. And Worrell pushes him out on the offside. They decide not to have a run. Dewes field and returns to Evans. That's the end of the over. 
399 for three wickets. The next applause will be for the 400 up, which will indicate a lead of 177 with seven wickets standing. A fairly good position to be in. It doesn't matter if the weather breaks now. In fact, it's doubtful if England could save themselves now by batting for two days. Always supposing they could bat for two days. Bedso with his widespread defensive field. No, presumably they won't take the new ball tonight. Bedso comes in, bowls to Weeks, and Weeks digs that out. It's pitched well up to him. Hits it hard to Jenkins at mid-on, <coughs> who comes up rather, rather tiredly from his bends and hobbles back. Again, Bedsa turns, comes quite strongly in from the pavilion end, bowls to Weeks, and Weeks goes forward and pushes him out on the offside for Yardley to come in from cover point and field. Becomes fast, medium right arm over the wicket, bowls, Weeks forward, a single. Easily taken, that's the 400 up. At the moment, the West Indies are 237 ahead, with their score 460 for three wickets, 234 to Worrell and 94 to Weeks. Now that's hammered out on the offside by Weeks, well fielded by Washbrook. Betzer heaves his shoulders, swings his arms back behind him until they meet, rolls his sleeve again, and comes Pounding ever optimistically in from the Radcliffe Road end, bowls to Weeks, and Weeks picks him off his toes, hits him hard to mid on. There, Dews fields it. Only three fieldsmen on the onside. In Seoul, down at Long Lake, ever active. Holly is at mid wicket, and Dews at mid on. The rest on the off. Bedzer comes in, bowls to Weeks, and Weeks throws his bat at a ball wide outside his off stump. A, a most impudent stroke. That ball was a yard wide of the off stump. Almost any other batsman in the world would have let it go by, but not Weeks. He threw his bat at it and at full arm stretch, clouted it through that packed offside field for four from the very second it left his bat. And now he's 98, waiting on his 100. And here's Betzer moving in now to bowl to him. And Weeks plays it comfortably out on the offside for Simpson with a rare show of energy for a quarter past six of a laborious Trent Bridge day to come in and flip it back to the bowler. 464 for three, 234 Worrell, 98 weeks. And now here's Bedser, comes in, bills the weeks, and he played that stroke again right through the offside for four and a century. The West Indies ran up a total of 558 in the end, a lead of 335. But in reply, Reg Simpson and Cyril Washbrook had a fine opening partnership. Now, Arthur Gilligan passes me the query as to who got his hundred first, Simpson or Washbrook. Because Simpson's come a long way up on Washbrook. He's 93 to Washbrook's 99 now. And Washbrook, tactically speaking, is not anxious to try the forcing stroke off Ramadan, I expect, I, I suspect. So Ramadan with one feels just the pull in confidence as the, the, between these two bowls to Washbrook. Washbrook turns him on the leg side. There are two men there to field it. Though Stolmeyer does miss field, but they've already said no, and they don't change their minds rather wisely. And still he hasn't got his run, and again that ripple of conversation comes round the ground, and Ramadin comes in, bowls to him again. Washbrook goes forward and just flicks it out on the onside. A little off the ground, but nowhere near a fieldsman. 209 for no wicket. And Ramadan comes in again from the Radcliffe Road end. Bowls to Washbrook. Washbrook turns him off his legs, and still there's no run. Fielded again by Stolmeyer near the square leg umpire. And this is the sort of time that leg break might be a trump card, with Washbrook looking to force it out there. Valentine crouching down by the square leg umpire. And Ramadan comes in, bowls to Washbrook, and Washbrook pads up, and the Ramadan asks. But the umpire won't have it, and he can only just have been outside the line of the off stump because he moved another foot after that ball hit him. So he's only just outside the line of the off stump, but not LBW. And Ramadin bowls again to Washbrook. 
And Washbrook turns that off his legs and there's his hundred. The West Indies won that test by 10 wickets and the four-match series 3-1 to underline their arrival in the front rank of cricketing countries. The following English season, South Africa were the visitors. England won the series 3-1, but in the fifth test at the Oval, John Arlott witnessed a unique dismissal for test cricket. Now Rowan comes in, bowls again, outside the line of the leg stump, Hutton hooks, misses, there's an appeal, something or other. There's an appeal, there's a certain amount of discussion going on out there. And Hutton's out. I think he was caught behind the wicket. There was a long, long pause before it was decided. Hutton looked extremely baffled. It was a long time before he went. There was a, uh, Eric Rowan came up and talked to the bowler and from Ending's attitude now, he's going through catching motions. I can only assume that what happened was this. We'll give Arthur Gilligan a chance to sort this, but now my impression is this. To a ball pitching on or just outside the leg stump, Hutton, who's now out, 27 out of England's 53 for the first wicket, Hutton played a ball that I should say pitched just outside his leg stump to hit it hard through the leg trap just backward of square. It was a great flurry of dust and he certainly didn't hit it where he intended it to. Now there was a flurry of player, Hutton and ending the wicket keeper, and just afterwards there was an appeal. Hutton stood absolutely still, paused for a few minutes and the umpire gave him out. Now, I don't know what Arthur Gilligan made of it. What did you make of it, Arthur? Well, I'm still wondering myself what happened. I see Chester is now coming. Caught at leg slip, is he? Let's hear what Chester's. <clears throat> I think everybody in the ground is, is baffled. And Chester is coming over, even for scorers. They're all watching now. The scoreboard hasn't. What did he say? Obstruction. Obstruction, it must be. Well, that's what I couldn't see any catch there, and the ball was on the ground. Obstruction. Well, he's been given out for obstruction of the field, apparently. I can only yes. think that uh, was yes, uh, that he swung on round in that hook mm -hmm. and hit Endine as Endine went for the ball. Well, then he seemed to swat at it again, you see, yes. while Endine was going for it. Yes. That's what am I reading? Uh, Hutton, in other words, trying to prevent the ball falling on his wicket. Mm. In, in the, in the uh, umpire's opinion, prevented the wicketkeeper from making a catch or from gathering the ball. Well, now, oh yes, uh, Roy Webber's here and <laughs> he's got the only four recorded cases of obstructing the field. He's out. He's out. He's out. May's out. First ball. And now May is out. Caught forward short leg. Caught Eric Rowan. Bold Apple Rowan. This is the most bewildering over. Now, uh, there, there are apparently only four previous cases, 1868, 1899, and yes, twice in 1901, yeah. a batsman's get, been given out for obstructing the field. But that is certainly the first time it has ever happened in a test match. And I, I suppose if it had been put to any of us, we'd have said the chances of it happening were a million to one against. And now there is a second wicket, May, caught Eric Rowan, bowled Apple Rowan, not. And England are 53 for two. And the wicket of the 21-year-old Peter May in his second test went almost unnoticed in the commotion. In 1954, Pakistan played their first visit to England. They will remember that for the victory at the Oval that Fuzzle Bahmood bowled them to. There was consolation for the bowlers who had suffered earlier at Trent Bridge at the hands of Dennis Compton. And now in comes Khan, bowls to him and he cracks that back down to mid-off, but mid-off is, I was going to say respectfully deep, mid-off's position is a women and children first position. Uh, they're obviously about to take to the boats and there are several players who if they went back three yards further wouldn't be on the field of play at all. The Pakistan side is as scattered as I've seen anyone uh, since England didn't like Bradman. And uh, now here's Khan coming in and he bowls to Compton and Compton covers up to a good one. Well bowled Khan. He went to the edge of the crease and there's not much swing left in it. The atmosphere doesn't want to play anyway and the pitch hasn't been playing for a day. But he pushed it in as his leg stumped from the edge of the crease. And any batsman's got to play that one with respect. It was on a length that was pretty quick, and it would have twirled his leg peg out of the ground. So Compton played it. 161 he is now. England 393 for four. And Khan bowls to him, and Compton hooks it. And it's four runs. And 
that one isn't in the, that one just isn't in the Stoke book at all. The remarkable thing about it is that Compton didn't wind himself because it was a short arm jab in which he drew his left arm back so hard into his stomach it's a wonder he didn't elbow himself in the spine. Uh, a powerful short armed hook. Uh, just a just the wrists and the forearms did it. Four runs like a rocket. 3.97 for four. Khan again in. Bowls to come to knee down the wicket. Knees hit him hard and high down through long arm. And there's no one there. It's another four at the 400 up. And this, a century Arthur Wrigley shows me, puts Compton above Hobbs in the number of test centuries scored. Though, and level with Sutcliffe, still behind Hutton and Hammond. Now here's Khan to Compton. Compton pushes that out on the offside. He's taken another single. Uh, this means to say that these two come together in the same world. And great worshipper of Jack Hobbs as I am, I think it must be said that Compton in his time has had a different but a comparable great playing often against the tide over the years when we were losing. And I think it's a bracket that Jack Hobbs would not resent and of which Compton, with his usual modesty, would be happily proud. Now, Khan to Bailey, and Bailey plays forward. You know, really, this seems like after the Lord Mayor's car, uh, show comes the dust cart. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Bailey's little forward stroke, when he's called upon to perform, uh, just doesn't seem to belong in the same world. I'm sorry if any of you listening habitually listen to test cricket, because I realize this doesn't sound like test cricket a bit. But it has, I think for many of us, a rather sad nostalgia. It's reminiscent of the Compton of 1947, who never failed and has never had the critics, any of them at all, on his collar. Playing for fun again. Now how long his wind is going to hold out under this galloping, I don't know. I think he might get out from sheer shortness of breath from taking runs. Well, now, Carter seems at the moment to have about five fieldsmen and seven missionaries. <laughs> you know, as they used to say in Victorian days, sent into distant fields. Uh, they're still in Trent Bridge, but only just. And now Carter comes in, bowls to Compton, and Compton off... Oh, I was going to say off the back foot. He dropped back level with the wicketkeeper and a yard outside his leg stump and hit it into the cover. That was coming at his leg stump. There's an e a cover on the boundary, an extra cover on the boundary, a long off on the boundary, a long on on the boundary. Carter bowls again, Compton goes down the track and he's hit it high and steep and there were two of them trying to catch it. They both dropped it and it's rolled over for four. I'm not sure that it doesn't become six. Now he's signaled four, but I think the crowd wants six there, that it bounced out of the hands and straight over the boundary. There were two men there, uh, a deep extra cover and long off. They ran in, collided and the ball dropped between them as it always does when anybody's giving it a hammer like this. That 1954 innings was to be Compton's highest test score, 278 in England's innings victory. Two years later, Australia ran into one of the most celebrated of all bowling performances at Old Trafford. And now it's locked to bowl to Johnson. In, bowls to him, Johnson covers up again, going right back and pushes out to May at forward short leg who wangs it back to lock. A low, hard throw. And again, lock comes in to bowl to Johnson. Now he's decided now to bowl over the wicket, and Johnson takes fresh guard. Now then, lock to Johnson. In, bowls to him, Johnson again, covers up, stabs out on the onside, and that's the end of the over. Laker coming out, uh, coming over, peeling off his sweater as he comes, handing it over to umpire Lee. And a bowl to Lindwall. The close field gathers, but there's a deep field. Richardson out on the deep square leg boundary, Statham at mid on. Cowdery at slip, Oakman forward short leg, Shepherd just backward a square, and Locke inevitably at fine short leg. In comes Laker, bowls, and Lindwall plays that. With a free flow of the bat back to the bowler. 203 for 8, Australia. 203 for 8. Lindwell 8, Johnson 1. And Laker comes in again to Lindwell. In, bowls. Lindwell plays. He's on the leg side and he's caught. 
Well, there's an appeal and he's out. Caught locked, bold later. Caught Linwell, caught locked, bold later, eight. Well, that's 18 wickets, the most ever taken by a bowler in a test match. 18 wickets to later. Johnson, not out, one. Lindwell, caught, locked. Bold, later, eight. Once more, Lock comes back with that customary lick of the fingers. In, bowls, quickish one. Johnson shuffling across, covers the break, and it was a fair amount because it was a bit short, and it and Lock dragged it down onto the pitch. It turned quite a bit. Johnson moved with it. You can see from the point he's patting now just how short that was dropped. Lock then to bowl to Johnson with England on the brink of victory. Lock to Johnson. He drops that out on the onside and that's the end of the over. 1905, Arthur Wrigley tells me it is, when England last won a test, when England last won a test at Old Trafford. They haven't won one this time yet, of course, but now their problem is to take one wicket in 63 minutes. And... Yes, go on, Arthur. Well, it, you said uh, since they won a test. You mean against uh, Australia? Against in Australia. Fa in fact, it's uh, 1905 since any game was finished. The Australians haven't won one either. Now, Laker comes in, bowls, and Maddox drives to cover. Well, Old Trafford has redeemed itself with a last hour of flawless sunshine. And Laker comes in again, hair flopping. Bowles turns it on to Maddox, appeals, he's out LBW, and Laker's taken all ten. The first man to congratulate him is Ian Johnson. And England have won by an innings and 170. And Laker has taken all 10 wickets for 53 in the second innings. All 10 for 53. Now, for statistical necessity, if I may use the phrase, I'm going to read you today's scorecard. Play started at 20 minutes to 12 with Australia 84 for two. Then McDonald, Court Oakman, Bold Laker, 89. Craig, LBW, Laker, 38. Mackay, Court Oakman, Bold Laker, not. Now here's the avenue forming up for Laker there as May pushes him ahead to go in first into the pavilion. All the members standing, waving their scorecards, standing up on the balcony, leaning down and applauding him. He runs up the pavilion steps in through that crowd and is followed into the pavilion and uh, there are friends of mine who said they weren't going to come today they thought it would rain well i admit it did look as if it was going to rain uh, they missed a very great piece of bowling in 1957 the west indies were back in england with the three w's and with ramadan and valentine again but at edgbaston in the first test peter may and colin cowdrey tamed their threat and by the fourth test at Headingley, England were right on top. Load out of John Goddard, faced yet again with an innings collapsing about his ears. He settles, those fields will group themselves round. Loader comes in, bowls to him, bowls in the Looping down the line of what was for him an outswinger. The stump leaving drunkenly back. West Indies are 142 for eight. And now indeed, Sonny Ramadan's batting capacity may be searched. 142 for eight, and the possibility, I think, is now not to be precluded that England may bat tonight and sample themselves the effect of a new ball in this light and in this atmosphere. The bowler's now very much on top. His two post bowlers have done a very fine job on a wicket that has never been really fast. I think the experts thought it might give them a little bit of help before lunch, but these two have found in this atmosphere encouragement all day long. Well, now, once again, there is, unless my eyes deceive me, uh, rain in the air, a uh, sort of scotch mist, but 
that nothing like that ever seems to deter these West Indies players. They pass one another, the outcoming batsmen passing the incoming, and they've shown every disposition always to get on with the game, whether it's going in their favour or not. And now, as Ramadin comes in, walking at a brisk military gait to be joined by Alexander, who must have a few butterflies under the bottom ring of his sweater, uh, the thought of his first test innings, the close fieldsmen group up. Gravely first, <coughs> Cowdery second, Shepherd third, Smith in the gully, Lock leg slip, Truman backward short leg, Evans standing back. Seven of them in a half circle round the bat as Loder from the pavilion end comes in, bowls to Ramadin, and Ramadin skies it, and Truman's under it, and he's caught it just by the square leg umpire, and West Indies are 142 for nine. With Ramadin caught Truman, bold loader, swinging, not 142 for nine, <coughs> and for loader, a hat trick is on. Well, Fred Truman can't catch him in this innings now for all his late acceleration. Uh, come in, if you will, Norman Yardley. Well, uh, there's no doubt about it. This, these two have really have made this, uh, this new ball move about in this heavy atmosphere. It, it, the wickets had nothing to do uh, at all with any of the wickets that have fallen today. Uh, it is purely uh, the heavy atmosphere and the ball has moved about uh, through the air. Uh, there may have been a slight movement from time to time off the seam, uh, off the wicket, but uh, generally it, it has been the atmosphere that has uh, made these, this ball move about and Loder in particular um, has made it go both ways. To give you an idea that when Smith was out, uh, the ball started outside the leg stump. Uh, he went across to glide it, but the ball came back through the air and uh, just flicked his, off, uh, his leg stump en route. And now, of course, the excitement is uh, boiling up, uh, everybody wondering whether Loder is going to get his hat-trick. I can't uh, quite remember. Can you, John, when the hat-trick was last done in the test match? I can't. I can't offhand. I, I know a man named Matthews did it in the triangular in 1912, <coughs> if that's any help to anyone, but I don't remember one since then. You set a problem here for Jack Price. He's searching amongst his library now. <laughs> I think, it, I think it, you'll find it was Matthews in the triangular. May have been one since. Now, it is the luckless Gilchrist to face Loder, but again, those seven close fieldsmen grouped around the bat and three up out in the defensive positions and Loder from the pavilion end comes in. Now bowls to Gilchrist and he's bowling all over the place. It's a hat trick and Loder is jumping about like a monkey on a stick. And everybody coming up. Fred Truman, bless him, flung both arms round Loder and Locke coming up to pat him on the back. And now I'm afraid, Jack Price, the question is duly relevant. When <laughs> was a hat trick last done in a test match? In 1963, Frank Worrell brought a strong West Indian side to England, which included Sobers, Hunt and Canhai, and whose cutting edge was the formidable fast bowling pair of Wes Hall and Charlie Griffith. They won the first test by ten wickets, but at Lord's became involved in one of the great classic test matches. Ted Dexter in England's first innings was equal to the fast bowling onslaught, and John Arlott's commentary complemented the nobility of the batting. It's Hall to bowl now to Dexter. He comes in from the nursery end at full split and bowls, and Dexter plays that very calmly back down the pitch off the middle of the bat as if Hall were a medium pacer. There is about Dexter when he chooses to face fast bowling with determination. I a sort of air of command that lifts him, or seems to lift him, above ordinary players. He seems to find time to play the fastest of bowling and still retain dignity, something near majesty as he does it. And Hall comes in again then. Bowls to Dexter. Dexter goes onto the back foot and hits him square, away to third man. He's imposed a third man on the West Indies. That's Butcher. But with the single, which takes the total to 35, that third man moves up and becomes a fourth slip for Barrington. So there are two silly mid-ons, a leg slip, three slips, now he's turned and run out again. So there's a third man for Barrington also, just Gibbs in front of the wicket on the offside. And 
another change there, and Hunt has come from leg slip to backward short leg. Moved a full 10 yards. And Holt comes in, bowls to Barrington, and Barrington dabs down on a ball of full length. Gibbs whips it in from cover, carries the stumps, but McMorris was backing up and stopped it. A well-taken quick single. Decking England to 36, Barrington to 5, with Dexter 23. <coughs> Now Hunt has moved back to leg slip. So again we have five men in a row there within a sixth of a circle and very deep indeed. And there's no doubt that the ball's going to carry if it's nicked. All bowls, no Dexter ball. flicks down the leg side, another no ball, and Hall hangs his head quite penitently. They will be, I fancy, that English umpires since the new rule, the front foot rule, have become altogether more no ball conscious and find, in fact, watching the back foot easier in terms of quickness of shout than watching the front foot. And this is a strange thing, but so it seems to be. The front foot call comes slower than the back foot call. In again comes Hall from the nursery and in. Balls to Dexter who gets over it and hooks it imperiously downwards past McMorris up at Silly mid on for two. McMorris turns to the alarm of an otherwise peaceful pigeon and throws back. The pigeon takes off and goes straight into the pavilion. 39 for two. Five to Barrington, 25 to Dexter. And still this ominous looking field with the men deep for the nick and up close for the man who plays back so that the ball pops up. And Hall ruefully tenses and flexes his right foot, sweeps in again. No ball. Balls to Dexter, another no ball, it's cut for four. <laughs> I was a little sorry to see this and I could wish, in fact, that the white marker would be produced, which was such a help to English pace bowlers in particular in recent seasons, this white metal marker to show the taking off point. And it'll take a bowler back a few inches and save him bowling a no ball under the old rule. I feel that would be a great help to these two because there's little doubt that they're bowling in their normal style and there's no attempt to take an advantage. Hall comes in, bowls to Dexter, who gets over it and hooks in magnificently. Away there, down to mid-wicket. It's chased, but fruitlessly, by McMorris. It's another four. This takes Dexter up to 33 out of 47. Of course, he's made bigger scores than 33 in test matches, and he may well do so this time. But I think I've never seen Dexter bat more reassuringly, nor more commandingly. And the situation he punched would have been a desperate one for any batsman in the world. He's risen to it quite gloriously. Dexter made 70 in that innings, which people still talk about. Eventually, England was set 234 to win, and the time available to reach that target was reduced by rain on the last day. Colin Cowdery had had his arm broken by a ball from Hall, who with Griffiths was making life very difficult for the batsman as the target came within reach with the brave six-wicket pair of Brian Close and Fred Titmus together. England won 43 to win in 55 minutes. And Hall, that little shower apparently wetted the outfield and for the first time today, a bowler has recourse to the sawdust heap. Hall comes down, dries it, turns at the pavilion end and comes up. Great tigerish run, the leap, he bowls to Titmus, Titmus covers up, it goes off the edge of the bat and he takes a single to Gully. A single to Gully there, the ball didn't travel a third as far as the batsman ran. A very quickly taken single to make England 1-9-2 for five. And this is where one's almost afraid to breathe for fear of rocking the boat. 
And these two batsmen now faced with a tactical decision off almost every ball. Two slips, leg slips, Salim it on for close. Hall comes in, bowls to him, and he plays that straight up to Salim it on, Worrell. Hall, Hall turns and walks back. Close again, goes out and prods the pitch. The trees away in the distance, heaving under this strong wind, which in fact would help Hall to swing the ball into close. The wind is coming in from about cover point, say extra cover. The trees heaving and bending under it. The light murky, and Hall comes up again. Past umpire Phillips and bolster close, close tries to hook. He's beaten long leg, it's through. It's four rounds. is 50 and the people here are only sorry they couldn't make 10 times as much noise and innings of remarkable shrewdness good judgment courage and very sound technique 50 in three hours 15 minutes with five fours his first 50 in a test his previous best 42 against the west indies at birmingham in 1957 and now it's all again from the pavilion end in balls to close and close Oh, tried to cut outside the off stump. Through to the wicket keeper, and about six rows of members down here fidget as if their ants were full of pants. It, uh, pants were full of ants. Uh, absolutely unable to, say, to stay still there. This awful moment when you see a batsman play outside the off stump at pace, and it goes through. One hundred and ninety six for five. <coughs> One nine six for five. And Hall comes in again. Bowls to close. Close tries to turn that on the onside. Takes it on the thigh again as he turns. Walks away with a little hobble. Still disdaining to rub. A very hard man, this. And he's been hit, I would think, a couple of dozen times on the thigh. He's resolutely refused to rub. He was cracked once on the forearm. And I would think that that was the first time in this innings that Brian Close has flashed outside the off stump. And the reaction amongst the crowd was almost terrifying. 196 for five then. 38 wanted. And Hall comes in, bowls to Close. Close hooks. And again he's beaten long leg. Uh, leg slip, but not long leg. Beautifully fielded by Butcher. They take a single, a Constantine-style sprint, pick up and return. It's 197 for five. Titmus 11, close 52. England 197 for five. Want 37 to win, and there are 52 minutes left. Well, still anybody's game, but close, I think, realizes the position. He's hitting at everything on the leg side, and really for the first time in this inning since T he's been connecting with the ball on the leg side he had one or two swings before T and never got a run from it but this time he's got two fours and two singles down the fine leg now Gibbs comes in balls to close it goes down the pitch but checks the stroke Worrell fields and you can hear the sighs come out of the spectators like punctured bicycle tires every time a risk is taken Everybody's walking the tightrope. Gibbs to close, tries to swing him. Appeal for RBW, not out. Taken by close at slip and he appeals for... Silver's at slip and he appeals for a catch. Ah. A few brows being mopped, though it's not a war warm afternoon. And Gibbs comes again and bowls to close, a little short, but close, using his reach, goes forward, smothers any turn, and plays it out on the offside. One, nine, seven for five. And still with this very economic field. Eight men saving the one. Gibbs comes in, bolts to close. Close swings him on the leg side. Four again. The two hundreds up. It's been a long, long road to home. 
England want 33. Gibbs bowls to close and close plays out on the offside. 201 for five. Close 56, Titmus 11. And that grotesque tower away in the distance suddenly catching the sun like a beacon. But the ground in gloom as Gibbs comes in, bowls, and close steals into short third man and takes a quick single as Nurse closes in the field. 202 for five. Close 57. Every Englishman in the ground with him. Every West Indian in the ground after his blood. Brown Close's heroics brought him a mass of bruises and 70 runs, but not the victory. The match ended in a heart-stopping draw after the injured Cowdery had returned at the fall of the ninth wicket with six runs wanted and two balls to go. The West Indies won the series 3-1, but Lords had not seen the last of its excitement for that year. In September came the culmination of the new county knockout tournament, the Gillette Cup. One day cricket had arrived, and at headquarters, Sussex and Worcestershire were up for the cup. One, four, five, four, eight, Sussex. And it looks as if this game could finish in semi-darkness. I think, in the conditions of an ordinary match, there might have been an appeal against the light by now. Car Carter comes in, then Parks lofts it. Well and bravely, over the head of square leg. Three men running for it as it runs to the pavilion rails and beats them all. And about 500 Sussex people who were leaning over the grandstand balcony so far that you'd have thought the building would have tilted burst into applause for Parks 50 and that four. Parks 51, Sussex 149 for eight. That's 50 in 94 minutes with three fours and a six. He takes guard again. Carter, well built, strong pace bowler, comes in Holds to Parks, drives him onto the back foot to play a defensive stroke. Back down the wicket. Which point, of course, if we'd had a West Indian crowd, everyone would have said, no. Back again with the bowler. Parks goes, moves up. Blade of grass from just in front of him. Easily the top scorer. And that was a no ball. One more to bring the 150 up. 150 for eight. Carter comes in again, bowls, and Parks cuts him so delicately for four. It was a steer more than a cut. Instead of going through with the full blow, he checked on impact and steered it wide of backward points left hand. A perfect four. Stroke of admirable timing on a slow wicket where the ball <laughs> will cut a bit perfectly tight to a ball of full length. 154 for eight Sussex. Parks, 55. Carter again. Comes in, bowls, and Parks hooks him. And this may not be four. It's being chased by Gifford out towards the mid-wicket boundary. They take two, think about a third. It isn't on. There's his long, hard left, left arm throw. Two runs, and Worcester again are in the tactical situation they wanted. Sussex, 156 for eight. And Flavel can bowl at Snow. But now, Mark, Flavel has only got two overs left. And that means that if these two can weather the two overs of Flavel, while there will be pace from Carter at the other end, it means a slow bowler has got to be brought on, and one or the other, probably Parks, can chance his arm and try to hit the spinners. So it's the spinners who've done the damage. We've only had the two pace bowler wickets, both of them late. And now, Kenyon has sent Flavel away, kept him up his sleeve, and he's bringing Slade on. Now he's worked this little trick with the utmost cunning. This means that if Sussex cut loose at the end, he's still got two overs of flavor to use to shut them up. And for a man with only two seam bowlers, he's contrived this quite magnificently. Helped a lot, of course, by that long 15 over spell of Giffords, when he not over only kept Sussex quiet, barely over two runs and over, but took four wickets as well. And now Slade, his fellow slow left arm bowler, slightly senior in the side, comes on at the pavilion end, and Kenyon moves, pulls Headley up on the straight drive to halfway to the boundary, but there is a long off. Slade comes in, bowls to Snow, and Snow going right back blinds Booth so that it runs off Booth's pad and out on the offside. Broadbent is up at slip where he caught Dexter so brilliantly. There's a short third man, a deep point and a cover, not a pitch length apart, those three, and a gap out 
to the man on the extra cover boundary, Slade bowls Snow cautiously forward. Slade jogs across and picks up. If risks are to be taken now, with nine overs left, one feels Parks must take them. Slade in, bowls to Snow. Snow pushes that out on the offside, playing as if it turned a bit. And it's picked up by Gravely at cover point. A short third man, deep point and a cover. Just see those three there in a 20, 25 yard line. Slade bowls again, Snow plays it out again to get Gravely, now closing right in at cover. What Sussex want, of course, is the single when Parks hasn't got the bowling, but Kenyon's field has seven men standing to stop that single. Slade in, bowls to Snow. Snow swings him up over the top, and Richardson's running round, picks it up on the first bounce, and returns. But there's that single they wanted, a little chancily struck. A good long throw from Richardson. Gets a round of applause, and it's one, five, seven for eight. Two to Snow. Parks has the bowling, Kenyon posts. Headley almost on the straight drive boundary. Graveney on the extra cover boundary. Richardson, wide long off. Brings Broadbent out of slips. Again, that row of three men between short third man and cover. And Parks looks at this field. Six men on the offside and one man almost straight. Slade comes in, pitches up. Parks draws back, he's out, straight on. Trying to cut, it came on with Slade's arm, and Parks is out, bold Slade 57. Sussex are 157 for nine, and Worcester can now have quite a bit of hope, though I fancy this game may still be very, very tightly balanced at the end. That was a shrewd judgment. Sussex won that first final by just 14 runs. Parks 57 was the highest score in the match, and it earned him the Man of the Match award. 1964 was an Australian year. There were many prodigious batting feats, notably by Peter Burge, whose innings at Headingley won the series for Australia, though not all the batting was as exciting as that. But at the Oval, all eyes were on a bowler, heading for a landmark in Test cricket. Truman back again, almost with a fidget on as he comes back, head down, scrubbing the ball furiously on his flannels. Moves in, again to the edge of the crease, bowls, Vivas tries to get a touch on it down the leg side. He doesn't touch it, Parks takes it, no run, 366 for eight. Truman back, a little sweat off the brow, onto the hand and onto the ball, and then a little polish on the flannels. And then straight away into the right hand, earlier than usual, and he comes in, bowls again from the edge of the crease. Fevers pulls the bottom hand away, dabs on the leg side, gets a single. This takes him up. Did he not get the back to it? Three, six, seven for eight. Three, six, seven for eight. 55, Fevers, 14, Hawk. And Truman now to bowl to Hawk. Still these four men up close, two slips, two short legs. Truman comes in, bowls from the edge of the crease, and that goes down the leg side. Hawk doesn't get a touch. Through to Parks. Three, six, seven for eight. Truman with a bit of a scowl at the batsman. Doesn't even look friendly towards his fieldsman at the moment. And his 31st over. His two wickets. Wants a third. Truman in again. Bowls to Hawk and Hawk goes forward and he's caught. There's the 300. There was no nicer touch than Truman congratulating Hawk. Hawk by Cowdery.
Neil Hawke can never have come into the pavilion to a greater ovation in his life, but they weren't looking at him. Fred Truman's 300th test wicket, the first man in the history of cricket to achieve the figure when Hawke played a half-hearted stroke outside the off stump to a ball that perhaps left him a little, took the outside edge and Cowdery swooped on it, two hands, it was high in the air, up went Truman, up went the crowd, stood to him, cheered him, and as Hawke walked away, Truman congratulated him. And the score, Australia 367 for nine. Fred Truman was approaching the end of his great test career, but another Yorkshireman started his in that series, and in that same oval test match, he made his mark. And Simpson is there, only two close fieldsmen, Simpson and Redpath. Both at slip, and in comes calling balls to Boycott, who tries to hammer him through the covers, mistimes it and hits the ball down into the ground. Well now, this man wants two for his hundred. The field, two slips, then a long leg, a square leg, in fact he's fractionally fine of the square leg umpire, just about as deep. A mid-wicket, a rather deep mid-on, a rather deep mid-off, a cover point and a third man. So there's a single to long leg or third man, but there are five others saving the one. And calling bowls and Boycott gets over it, doesn't time it properly, hits it quite hard and uninhibitedly into the covers. O'Neill fields. This would be his second century in succession. He got one at Bradford, didn't he? Against Australians, Australians, yes. But it'd be his first test hundred, of course, yes. and calling one fields, trying to tempt him outside the off stump calling comes in again bowls and that was a good ball it swung just a little bit late in flight came on to boycott and he took it bat and pad calling usually bowls the outswing and that seemed to me to come into him just a little bit very late in flight after those two that were wide outside the off stump boycott a little hunched again Calling comes in, bowls to him, outside the off stump, going away, keeping rather low, and Boycott plays no stroke, lets it go through to Grout. Slightly slower, and kept lower, he pulled his bat out of the stroke. 98, Boycott, swallowing two for the hundred. Five men saving the one, two up for the catch. Calling comes in, bowls outside the off stump. There it is, four runs, wider covers left hand. It crosses the rope, beats Laurie. Boy cut 102. Wrigley passes me a note to say 100 in 3 hours 55 minutes with 9 fours and I believe by no means the last test 100 we'll see from this man. In 1965 South Africa came to England with an exciting young side to play three tests. It was to be the last series between the two before sporting isolation for South Africa who won it 1-0 with the Pollock brothers supreme at Trent Bridge. Fast bowler Peter took five wickets in each innings to support the domination of brother Graham with the bat. 120 out of South Africans, 173 for five, and he's now hit 20 fours. Barber bowls for him again, he goes down the wicket, he pulls that out on the onside, Snow can't cut it off, four more. A hundred and twenty-four Pollock out of South Africa's one seven seven for five. In fact, a hundred and twenty-four out of a hundred and sixty-one since he came in. It really is very much like a one-man band. Barber comes in, bowls again. This Pollock cuts out to third man, Boycott, a comfortable single. One ball for Van der Merwe to play. The field comes up much closer for him. A defensive screen of four on the offside and a slip in. Three men saving the one on the onside. Oh, I'd have thought they'd be glad to give him one. Barber bowls, and again Barber stops with his boot. He turns it out to 
Mike Smith at cover point. And that's the end of the over. With Van der Merwe 10, Graham Pollock 125, South Africa 178 for five. I think we saw there what a great player Pollock is. Apart from his driving and everything like that, he's prepared to use his feet, get to the pitch of the ball, get it on the full toss, and he hit it very hard indeed over the square leg boundary. What I think everybody has been so delighted is when South Africa were 43 for four, Pollock, having been in there for some time, was straight away into an attacking form of cricket. He didn't allow the bowlers to settle down and pin him down. He was after the runs from the word go. Now Cartwright from the city end, bowls for Pollock and he's out. Caught it, slipped by Cowdery. Savor this applause. Everyone in front of the pavilion standing as Graham Pollock walks in. Graham Pollock, Court Cowdery, Bull Cartwright, 125. An innings that not only saved South Africa, but saved them so gallantly that I think nobody who for who's seen it will ever forget it. It was an innings of infinite grace, ease, confidence. Almost every stroke in the book played with utter certainty. It must make every other batsman in the game seem slightly second rate as handsome an innings as we're going to see for a very long time nineteen sixty three had seen the birth of one day cricket it reached a new pinnacle in nineteen seventy five with the first world cup australia met the west indies in the final at lords and provided a glorious feast of cricket for all and for john arlott in particular and they've scored off the last 15 balls. Now difficult, not only to bowl a maiden over, but apparently to bowl a maiden ball. <laughs> 185 for three, and Gilmore, my word, how life can change between Wednesday and Saturday. Still a useful bowler, and still not the easiest problem for Lloyd to solve. Gilmore comes in, bowls, and Lloyd hits him. High away on mid wicket for four. No trouble at all, and it takes Lloyd to 99. Lloyd 99 and 189 for three. An umpire bird having a wonderful time, signalling everything in the world, including stop to traffic coming on from behind. But he's left Gilmore in now, and he comes in, bowls, and Lloyd hits him in the cover. There's his hundred, only half fielded out there on the cover boundary, and the century is up, and the whole ground seething with leaping West Indian delight. I can only say it was worth this. It was worth the treatment it's getting. I thought I saw a policeman applauding. What an innings. 100 of 82 balls in 100 minutes with two sixes, 12 fours, and even Kanhai outshone. And Gilmore bowls and Kanhai clears him down the third man. Turner. And there's his return. One run to Kanhai, which sounds like anti-climax, and takes him to 48. Oh, that was a very good over act clear. Only one boundary. A near maiden of boundaries. <laughs> and uh, Ian Chappell still going through with this tactical job. At least Greg is bringing on again, isn't it? Walt Doug Walters, which is the same thing under a different name. 
but he is a useful change bowler, Doug Walters. And a great knack at getting out batsmen that better bowlers can't get out. But I shouldn't think he asked to be put on at the moment. Going to bowl to Canhide, which gives him a chance off the first ball. It's 191 for three with 17 overs to go. And this whole ground seething. Walters then to bowl to Kanhai. Comes in, bowls, and Kanhai slashes. It goes through low to Marsh. He didn't touch it. And that's the first time for hours that a ball has passed unviolated. Okay. 73 off eight overs, Bill Pringle tells me. This is nine and over, and this is off a test attack. And Walters comes in, pitches up. Kanhai tries to play him down the leg side. Marsh gets who is the entire close field, gets across and drops a glove on it. Walters back to his mark. He's medium pace, right arm, and he does get people out. He's giving the ball an optimistic shine on the seat of his pants. Comes up, bowls from very near the stumps, outside the off stump, and that's four runs. And up go the cheers again. And this, I suppose, is what Tony Cozier would call Caribbean Cricket Union really in the sack. I mustn't show a Guyana bias. Can I's 50 of 99 balls in 141 minutes with eight fours. And Walters comes in, balls to him again. He tries to turn it on the leg side. Mark tries to run him out. Hits the stumps, knocks the bales down, picks it up, goes halfway up to the bowler and very nearly collected the bales and he was beaten to it by umpire Bird who is continuing to emphasise that he's the fastest mover on the field. 195 for three in the 44th over. Lloyd 100, Kenai 52 and West Indies having themselves a ball. And up comes Walters again, pitches up. Kenai drives him straight. And Turner, down at mid-on, looking more and more like Slasher Mackay, fields and returns. He can't quite do the Slasher's nocturnal prowl, but otherwise he looks just like him. Cat, feet, cocked, and high shoulders, pitching his slacks there, as Walters prepares to bowl to Clive Lloyd, with Ian Chappell deciding to field at slip. Fly slip short third man third man is walking backwards steadily <laughs> now the field spread really far and wide and Walters bowls and Lloyd hits him into the covers and Costa can't stop it Ross Edwards coming down round behind does returns two runs a low accurate throw two off that the end of the over 198 for three the next thing to cheer is 200 up. Lloyd 102, Kanhai 53. 43 overs bowled, 198 for three. And this 44 overs has just gone up. And this game just sailing out ahead of Australia like an express train leaving the station. And now it's Gilmore. Gilmore to Kanhai in bowls. And he just pushes that away out into the open country to Thompson. Ian Chappell, of course, trying now with Gilmore and Walters to have his better bowlers in hand when the last ten overs start and they embark on the real slog. Now Gilmore to Lloyd. He shapes to flick that down the leg side, doesn't touch it. Marsh going across, takes it. And you must believe me that there is no Australian within shouting distance of Marsh. They really have departed to the distant depths of the field. Third man on the boundary, point on the boundary, square leg on the boundary, long leg on the boundary. Long off trying to pretend he isn't on the boundary. Lovely take by Marsh, appealed by Gilmore. Wait a minute, this might be out. Umpire's conferring. Bird thinks he touched it. Did he carry is the question? He's asking the square leg umpire. A thin edge, did he carry? He's out, he said. Caught 
Marsh pulls Gilmore. Lloyd is out. And a bit of trouble now. Oh, silly. Beer cans being thrown. People coming on the pitch. Silly. Great inning. Let him applaud him in, not so dear can. There's the applause for a splendid innings. 199 for five. And to be fair, it was the beer that threw the beer cans. And Fly Floyd out. Foot Marsh, Bold Gilmore, 102. The West Indies 291 for eight was enough to win the Prudential Cup, but not by all that much. It took five runouts, three by Viv Richards, to secure the victory by 17 runs. Australia still had four tests to play that summer against England. Tony Gregg started his captaincy at Lord's, where he introduced us to David Steele. But on the fourth afternoon, it was a member of the crowd who stole the limelight. So, warmer six, not 11. England, 399 for six, 399 for six. Uh, there's some signals going on to the, to the dressing room. Warmer is running in. Lots of people are running out. Old is bringing Warmer what? Glass of water. Unusual, isn't it? And, <laughs> and a freaker. Oh, a freaker. They've got a freaker down the wicket now, not very shapely, and it's masculine. And I would think it's seen the last of its cricket for the day. <laughs> the, the police are mustered, so are the cameramen, and Greg Chappell. And now uh, he's had his load, he's being embraced by a blonde policeman. And this may be his last public appearance, but what a <laughs> splendid one. And so warm. Many, of course, have done this on cold rugby grounds. But this chap has done it before 25,000 people on a day when he doesn't even feel cold. <laughs> and he's now being marched down in the final exhibition past at least 8,000 people in the man stand, some of whom perhaps have never seen anything quite like this before. <laughs> and he's getting a very good reception. And at least he's being escorted off by an inspector and no play will be restarted <laughs> until he's gone. Fine performance, but what will they do about finding his swimming trunks? A moment of fame for a merchant seaman called Michelangelo. 1977 saw the centenary of Test cricket, and to celebrate it, Australia organised a magnificent occasion at the Melbourne Cricket Ground, where it had all started. The England team arrived from a highly successful tour of India for a one-off centenary Test match, and so did hundreds of former players. The BBC's contribution was to send John Arlott, who had not been there since 1955. England bowled Australia out quickly on the first day and found themselves batting that evening. And Lily setting now a field of immense hostility. Two short legs, four slips, two gullies, only one man out, that's Davis. And he moves in to bowl to Underwood with the chant of Lily, Lily in the background, in, falls short. Underwood goes back, plays it down on the onside. Loves to stick on the line, this boy, and be a night watchman and prove that he's a bit of a batter. And the crowd now, as the sun and the beer combined, do their work away in the distance, uh, letting out the chant of Lily, 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 and appealing for some quite remarkable non-events. So then Lily comes back to the beginning of his long run. He's looked occasionally to be flagging a bit. Moves in now, un just Underwood's face in the light, the rest of him in shadow. Lily comes in, bowls to him, and he plays all across that, gets an inside edge, and plays it down to Walker at backward short leg. There is no deep fieldsman, and there's only really one man in front of the wicket. Cozier is fractionally in front of square at short leg. Davis is at wide mid-off come cover point, but then four slips, two gullies, and a backward short leg. The other hazard at the moment is a colony of silver gulls, uh, several hundreds of them. At first they pitched on the top of the stand as if they were vultures recruited for Lily. But now they've come down onto the 
round in considerable numbers. And Lily then comes in again, bowls to Underwood, right up to him, he turns that off his legs, to way on the leg side, and that's gone for four. And it's not often that Underwood hits Lily for four, and there was a brief exchange of what are usually called pleasantries. And Underwood steps up, still this grotesque effect of his face lit by the sun, the rest of his body in shadow, as Lily comes in, bowls short to him, and he goes right back, unflinching, and plays it down at his feet. And Cozier hurries in to pick the ball up for Lily. Lily being used now in his, this is fifth over. In the attempt to enlarge his breakthrough, he's got rid of Walmer. On the whole, the two England openers had batted, I thought, fairly soundly. Six wickets for Dennis Lilly were to shoot England out for just 95, which was followed by an Australian second inning score of 419 for nine declared. It set England an apparently impossible 463 to win. They made the sort of start, though, which encouraged Test Match Special in England to stay on the air all night for the last day's play, something of a precedent at the time. We were rewarded by a great innings by Derek Randall. Well, if you're awake in England, it's worth staying awake. Still, I reckon. Take a sickie in the morning. Walker moves up, <laughs> bowls to Greg, Greg out on the offside, fielded again by Walters. And England, I think I've rarely seen them play a better last day. Perhaps they did Lindsay at Lords in 1953 when they saved a the game. Oh, yes, this is, uh, but yes, that was a great day for England. So it is, a magnificent day. And talking of sickies, don't you think there should be a few ladled out of the people out here watching this test match? It's been fairly torrid, you know. <laughs> Very exhausting and nerve-wracking. Walker then comes in, bowls, and Greg plays this back out on the offside. Walker himself follows through and field. And Walker, I don't know if it's some sort of strange communication, has suddenly started to run up in Lily's footmark very strange. He starts not as far back as Lily did. He's coming up on exactly the same angle whereas formerly he came in straighter. Anyway, he starts off now. Switching the ball from left hand to right. Comes in a lovely cartwheel of the right arm. And Greg slashes him. And that's through. And it hits the fence behind Slip. If Gilmore touched that, he did well because it was a full-blooded stroke. Savagely returned by Lily. And it was an outside edge to a firm attacking stroke. He really gave it what he had, and it went wide to Gilmore's right. And it looks as if he did just get his finger to it, you think, Lindsay? I think no, just too, just wide, I think, uh, John. Uh, second slip, I see even another second slip there, or another slip to Gilmore is, is pretty wide now. But uh, it was just to his right hand side, I would say, missed by near up the foot again and that's carefully played down by Greg. Pesco took Greg to 31, Randall's 174, the actors are 21. England are 346 for four and I think you can say that their hopes are mounting. Randall was out shortly after that for 174 and despite making the highest fourth inning score in Anglo-Australian tests of 417, England, as they had in 1877, lost by 45 runs, a barely credible coincidence. A couple of months later, the Australians were in England for a test series. At Trent Bridge, Jeff Boycott returned from a self-imposed three-year exile from international cricket. He found himself batting with the local hero, Derek Randall. And the field now, three slips and two gullies close to the bat. And Robinson has moved a little deeper and a little finer at short leg. He's backward of square now. And in just about the position where in 1948, Len Hutton three times caught Bradman. He's so about 12 to 14 yards deep and a bit fine of square. Thompson. Comes in, bowls to Boycott, Boycott pushes that. There must be a run out here. Oh, how tragic. How tragic, how tragic, how tragic. We welcome World Service with the news that Randall has just this minute been sacrificially run out and England are 52 for three. 
Let's leave the applause for Randall from a Trent Bridge crowd as he comes in. Very crest ball and un very unlucky. Almost with tears in his eyes, he looks very disconsolate. Go on, Fred. Well, the run out's been on all the time because uh, they have not run very well together since they, they came together. Uh, this morning when uh, Boycott was running with Brearley, uh, a run out looked on to me then because uh, early on, Jeff Boycott pushed one into the covers and shouted for one and set off and Brearley sent him straight back and there was just no chance of a run. What happened there, I just don't know. Because I don't think for one moment, uh, John, there was ever a run there at all. Except uh, Boycott was home in the distant crease and Randall set off and was halfway down the pitch when he was run out. Yes, quite agree. He could there have, were uh, two men in the crease at one time and the wicket hadn't been broken. That's right, yes. Uh, I think he had to go at once. I uh, don't oh, he know what at once. He might have just got there, but uh, he, he seemed to be standing with the, uh, um, the bat there and... Uh, he just didn't seem to take any notice. So whether there was a, a call of yes or run, I don't know. I never heard anything. Well, certainly Boycott set off, and certainly it was Boycott's call, wasn't it? Oh, it was Boycott's co call. That Randall just stood there watching the ball. Well, Boycott made amends by making a century, and England won handsomely with himself and Randall at the crease, and Randall making the winning runs. That test saw the start of Ian Botham's phenomenal international career, and the following year brought another new name to the colours. There's no doubt to my mind, Fred, that this patch is becoming increasingly difficult and the batsmen increasingly aware of it. That's very true, uh, and I would think that the England bowlers, uh, if they're sat <coughs> watching this, will be hoping that uh, they do get something like 150, 200 lead, and they've got something to bowl up there, haven't they? They've indeed the Arcat to Brearley then. He missed times and attempted square cut. And this is a state of mental conditioning where the batsman must, must watch for this particular spot if the ball lands near it. He's got to assume it's going to lift and keep away from it. Otherwise, he, he can play a stroke. And it's a schizophrenic state of existence, which was apparent in that <coughs> stroke of Brearley's then. Up comes the arc up then. From the city end, bowls and Brearley swings him away on the leg side. He won't get four because it's fielded by Musin Khan. Coming around very quickly on the leg side. And Brearley has run out. <laughs> uh, to his surprise, it's a splendid return by Musin. Well gathered by Wasim Barry. And Brearley is out. Run out 38. Or should it be 39, Bill? 38. Just one run, please. He was 37, yes. of course. He counts the first one. A very fine piece of fielding by Mussine. And England are 101 for two. And really, again, has lost his wicket when perhaps he might not have done it. But it was a first-class piece of fielding. And now, instead of Root, Gower is coming in. Gower of Leicestershire, Kentish born. The young left-hander who's England's cricketer of the moment. This splendid, stylish stroke maker. Superb timer of the ball and this couldn't have been better if stage managed, but he should come in at this moment. And now Wasim Barry has decided to put the pressure on him. <coughs> Let's see to what extent. Two slips, gully. Two slips, two gullies for the left-handed Gower. And to bowl at him, Liakad Ali, left arm, fast medium over the wicket. And there's a mid-off and a third man, and a change now of field. Brings Sadik into slips. Two slips, two gullies. Wide mid off, third man. Just wide mid on, square leg and long leg on the leg side. And Liakad comes in, bowls to Gower, and Gower turns. And this is the full death cricket for four behind square leg. <laughs> Oh, what a princely entry. He is a good player, this boy. Perhaps the one really class batsman in the side. And he's hit his first ball in test cricket for four. 
And if that doesn't make him feel better, he's a very odd young man as well as a brilliant one. 105 for two then. With England losing Wood, LBW to Sikander for 14. Brearley run out for 38. Radley's made 27. Gower, after one ball, four. Gower made 58, and England won by an innings. Both of them, the old hand, incidentally, made a century. And so to the 80s and the end of this great career. John chose to make England's centenary test at Lord's in 1980 his last. Sadly, the match was not the success of its Australian counterpart. The Saturday was one of those frustrating days when, in bright sunshine, the crowd waited for the ground to dry after rain. In the commentary box, the conversation was animated. What I hate is this sun blazing down and people waiting for cricket and getting none, and I think you're over polite. I think they're not quiet and contented and patient. I think they're becoming impatient. And I think they have every right to be impatient. And I think what they're facing is the worst type of bureaucracy, which is doing the thing by the letter of the law instead of the spirit of the law. What we want to see is some cricket out there, and even if they tell the fieldsmen not to go on the mud, surely these people playing an historic match, celebrating 100 years of test cricket in this country, with a Saturday crowd here, ought to say, well, we'll go out there, even if we do slip up. I think there will be 100% uh, support for that view in the crowd here, John, and I, I think you're expressing the thoughts of almost everybody here. Um, when I say almost everybody, the only possible exceptions are the umpires at the moment in whose hands it rests, and they have a, a, a great fixation about their responsibility in terms of safety to the players, which as the president of the Cricket Association, you will appreciate, I'm sure. Indeed, but I do wish you know, everybody could be entertained to that gr by that great dramatic presentation of Dickie Bird worrying about whether to order play or not, because yes. the yes. anguish on his countenance <laughs> is something that, you know, the great actors of the past would have given anything. You can imagine Irving, if he could have registered suffering as Dick does, when he puts his boots in a quarter of an inch of water and hoists his trousers to his calves to pretend he's being splashed. Now, this is one of the great <laughs> dramatic presentations of all time. He would have made a great King Lear, wouldn't he? My word, he would. What is so extraordinary is they must have made a decision, but there's now this business of the ground authority. They've already been off for five minutes, and uh, they haven't come to a decision, so there must be a tremendous argument going oh, on. You see, they're about to make a statement, Brian, and Dickie's worried about the syntax. <laughs> well, I'm sure he's inserting a few extra commas. And as the chap down there said, what we want is some adjectival cricket. And that's what they want. They shouldn't sure have cricket adjectival or not. It uh, is. Uh, uh, I mean, what, what is happening? Who is uh, there? The people. Well, I the imagine the sort of discussion is taking place down below us, as it's taking place up, up here. here. Yeah. And somebody doesn't want to play, and a number of people think they ought to play, and it's their duty to play. But you see, uh, not not to flung my ideas, but if they'd got a few strips of ordinary matting, matting wicket to stretch over those muddy patches, as they do when a Sunday match right, is right. taking place on a ground where three-day games in progress, they could play and surely even the umpires would allow the players to run over matting. They did at last play, though on the last day it was heading for an inevitable draw when John neared the end of his last test commentary. Two more to boycott then, 28, 69 for two. And the batsmen out in the England innings, remembering they were set 370 to win in a minimum of 350 minutes. That's bright. The boycott and pushes us away up on the onside. Little trouble in reading the flight there. Gooch, LBW, Lily, 16. Athy, Court, Laird, Bold, Pasco, 1. It was 19 for 1, 43 for 2. And bright again, going round the wicket to the right handed boycott and boycott. Pushes this away between silly point and slip. It's picked up by Mallet at short third man. And that's the end of the over at 69 for two. 28 by nine runs off the over. 28 boy cut, 15 gower. 69 for two. And after Trevor Bailey, it will be Christopher Martin Jenkins. <laughs> well, the applause is, um, I'm very lucky, really, to have been on while John completed his last commentary 
and on behalf of um, the Test Match special team and listeners, uh, we thank him very much indeed. And would he open that bottle of champagne a bit quickish? At the end of the following over, the crowd had their chance to pay their tribute. The end of a testing over from Lily, full of hostility. Close fielders still group round the bat, but safely and capably survived by Boycott and Gar. 72 for 2, 28 now, Boycott, 18 Gar. The applause was for John Arlott, his last commentary. And uh, Trevor, the entire Australian fielders clapping. Jeff Boycott having a clap there. And I'm sure the entire ground clapping at that announcement by Alan Curtis that John has just done his final test match session. A moment indeed of nostalgia and a very nostalgic match.